Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about section 33 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is also known as the Notwithstanding Clause. Now, for my Canadian viewers, this may be a little surprising. For my American viewers, this may blow your minds, because this is a really strange thing, and it's been described as uniquely Canadian, which is not always praise. Let's have a look here as to why I'm covering this, and that's because this has been in the news. Ontario to introduce legislation invoking the notwithstanding clause on Thursday. Now, this video will probably be going live on Thursday, so this may have already happened. Why is Ontario looking to invoke the notwithstanding clause? Well, because they lost a major Charter of Rights and Freedoms case. They wanted to restrict third-party advertising, and unions objected. They say, listen, we need to be able to criticize the government. And the court said, we agree with the unions. This violates their freedom of expression. And so this law has to be struck down. So the response is that Ontario wants to introduce uh, the notwithstanding clause. So what does the notwithstanding clause do? Well, that is section 33 here. So parliament or the legislature of a province may expressly declare in an act of parliament or of the legislature, as the case may be, that the act or a provision thereof shall operate notwithstanding a provision included in section 2 or section 7 to 15 of the charter. And they also go on to say an act or provision of an act in respect of which a declaration is made in this section is in effect shall have such operation as it would have but for the provision of this charter referred to in the declaration. That's really dense legal language. What does that mean? Well, it means that the government, uh, and that's either the federal government or a provincial government, can declare that a little, you know, a piece of legislation or an entire act applies even though it violates the charter. They can say, listen, we know this violates these sections of the charter. We want it to apply anyway. And when they do that, it basically applies as if those sections of the charter didn't exist. You might be thinking, wow, what limits do they put on this power? And really, there's only one limit, and that is that it shall cease to have effect five years after it comes into force or on such earlier date as may be specified in the declaration. So the longest that can last is five years. The idea being is that there needs to be an election in between uh, when this is put forward and when they want to renew it. So um, the next thing we need to know is what provisions does it allow the government to ignore? That's sections 2 and section 7 to 15. But before we get there, we should actually have a look at section 1. The reason why is that section 1 is a big limiting clause to all rights in the Canadian Charter. And it says that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So, these rights only apply subject to limits. The government can actually say, listen, we want to limit your freedom of expression so long as it's a reasonable limit that they can demonstrably justify. The test for demonstrably justified is actually super low. They don't really have to show much in terms of evidence as to why it's needed. This is a giant sort of escape clause already built in. So why would they need section 33 given that section 1 is there? Well, they might want to do something that is not a reasonable limit, that's an unreasonable limit, or that they can't demonstrably justify, which again, real low standard. They basically have to say that they're concerned that a harm might happen and they don't have to be crazy about it. So, you know, it's section 33 is really there for when the government wants to do something crazy and unreasonable. And let's see what sort of crazy and unreasonable things they can do. Well, they can suspend section two. Everyone has the following fundamental freedoms. Freedom of conscience and religion. Freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. Freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association. These are declared to be fundamental freedoms in Canada that the government can only infringe if it's a reasonable limit or if they just declare that they're infringing it. So think about this. You know, they can say, you no longer have freedom of religion. We're putting a bill through and we know it's trampling your freedom of religion. We're doing it anyway. Or freedom of thought or belief. 
I agree that those are fundamental freedoms. I don't agree that they should be able to just turn those off if they become inconvenient. Let's look at some legal rights because that's where it kicks in again. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So they weren't trying to get rid of jail cells, but they were trying to say you only end up in a jail cell if you have done something, you know, wrong, something where you have been convicted of a crime in a fair trial. Well, they can turn that off if they want. Uh, right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. Right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. Right when you're arrested or detained to be informed of why and to retain and instruct counsel. There's some even bigger ones in there. The right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to law in a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, not to be denied reasonable bail without just cause. Not to be found guilty of an, on account of any act or omission unless, at the time of the act or omission, it constituted an offense under Canadian or international law or was criminal according to the general principles of law recognized by the community of nations. So what does that mean? Well, let's say uh, today you possess marijuana in Canada, and right now it's legal to do so within certain restrictions. But let's say you get a future government who is really anti-marijuana, and they don't want to just punish people who possess marijuana going forward after they've banned it. They want to punish all the people who possessed it during the time, you know, right now, where it's legal. So they want to make a retroactive law that punishes people for possession of marijuana back when it was legal. The charter says you can't do that. Unless they want to. <laughs> Which is... Think about what this means, right? The fundamental essential thing here is that you should know that if you do legal things, you're not going to be punished for them. That a future government can't say, listen, not only do we want to ban guns, but we want to throw people in jail who had legal guns. <laughs> this is such an essential, critical right just to be able to rely on the thing that I'm doing is legal and therefore I won't ever be punished for it. That it's shocking that they can say, nah, we're canceling that. Everyone has the right not to be subjected to any cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. This is the section of the, the charter that they often refer to, for instance, if the police decide to lay a beating on you. You'll argue that that violates your rights under section 7, which they can again infringe, and section 12. And here, this one just makes me shake my head when I think about it. A party or witness in any proceeding who does not understand or speak the language in which the proceedings are conducted, or who is deaf, has the right to the assistance of an interpreter. So let's say you are a deaf Canadian and they have charged you with a serious offense. You know, let's say they say that you've murdered somebody. If they decide that they don't like to, and they pass a law invoking the notwithstanding clause, in theory, we could have a trial run for that individual where they're not able to know what's going on. Defense lawyer and Crown are making arguments and they don't understand them because there's no interpreter. The judge makes a ruling and they don't know what the ruling is because they don't know what they don't have an interpreter there. The idea that this is theoretically possible under Canadian law is is startling. Now, as I mentioned before, there is really only one limit on this power, and that limit is elections because you know, you can't renew this indefinitely. There's got to be an election in between those things. And elections are actually one of the few things that they can't suspend under section 33. They can't say, okay, we're canceling your right to vote. So what this means is that it's very important for Canadians to make sure governments don't get comfortable with this and that we as the electorate don't get comfortable with this because the real big concern I have is right now, uh, the notwithstanding clause is a big deal politically. People tend to vote out governments that use the notwithstanding clause. But let's say we stop doing that. Let's say we let governments start doing this and it becomes routine. Well, what rights are we going to have left if we let governments start 
basically opting out of all of these critical, essential rights. So I'm not going to tell anyone how to vote because you guys, you know, you make your own decisions and everyone has different priorities. And that's one of the wonderful things about an electoral system. You go into that box and you vote for what's good for you. My personal rule is that any government that touches the notwithstanding clause, I'm going to vote against. And that applies no matter how much I like them. You know, they could do everything I want. They could basically, you know, for every decision they make, except this one, if they were calling me up and saying, hey, Runkle, do we do this or do we do the other thing? You know, so I could be in full control of this government, except for the notwithstanding clause. And I'd still vote them out if they, or try to vote them out if they wanted to touch this. This is such a dangerous thing that's built in. Now, I would love to see a constitutional amendment to take out the notwithstanding clause. I don't think it has a place in modern society. I don't think it is something that we as Canadians should have much use for. But the amending formula to change the constitution in Canada is basically, it's so difficult to change the Canadian constitution that the amending formula might as well just be, no, stop it. Um, I'd also love to see a change made to Section 1 to require the government, for instance, to provide more actual evidence for demonstrably justified. Right now, the courts have essentially set a standard of, is the government not crazy here? I would love to see a standard that was more of a uh, balance of probabilities or even something more like clear and convincing evidence. So something like a 50% plus one standard or even something more along the lines of like 75%, 80%. Because we're talking about fundamental, essential rights. If the government wants to step on those, that shouldn't be easy. In some cases, it shouldn't be possible. The I, I'm probably going to do a video at some point talking about the difference in terms of what section one does and differentiating it from the American approach, which is that rights are absolute. However, that'll be for another video. For right now, I hate that they're wanting to use the notwithstanding clause. I hate that they're wanting to use it on something that seems so trivial. And frankly, that seems to benefit that party directly. You know, they're wanting to limit election ads because they think it's gonna hurt them. So I got problems with that. Anyway, I wanted to share with you guys, a lot of people have been writing me and saying, what is the notwithstanding clause? Can you do a video on it? So I wanted to cover that. If you found this video to be useful, if it's expanded your legal knowledge, please like this video, please share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. There's a link in the description below. At the $50 level, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Jason Elliott, Canada's National Farms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, Christopher Molina, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Marc Olivier de Moor. And at the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Adam Meester. I also want to thank everyone at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge.